Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, we're going to be in verses 32 to 44 this morning. Matthew 27, starting in verse 32 and going to verse 44. This is a story that's very familiar to you, I think. Most people will be familiar with it. Let's read what it says here in Matthew 27, 32. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled him to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross. And we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Let's pray over the word that we've read. Heavenly Father, it is time for the blinders to come off. I pray every heart in this room, that as we've read this text that is so pivotal for what we believe, that we would truly come to an understanding of it. And as we've prayed already, what is required for that is you. Would you please remove all the blinders from our hearts today? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this week and next week, we're going to be looking at the crucifixion this week, obviously, and next week, the death of Jesus. Now, obviously, there are aspects of Matthew, this particular story in Matthew, and Mark and Luke and John, for that matter, these aspects of the story are probably well known to you. This is well-trodden material, I think, for most of the people in this room. And they're also the center of the gospel account. These stories of Jesus' crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, is the center of all four gospel accounts. And this is the point that Matthew has been building to this entire time, was to see Jesus up on the cross as he is now. I'm going to confess to you something that, you know, I probably don't say too much, but there is a temptation anytime Easter rolls around, anytime Christmas rolls around, any of the big Christian holidays, anytime uh, we preach the text of the death, burial, ascension, resurrection of, of Christ, anytime those things come up, there is a tension that I feel all week to stand up here and absolutely swing the bat as hard as I possibly can. You know what I mean? To try to preach the absolute best sermon that I possibly could ever preach from the bottom of my feet, and just swing for the fences. Because, truly, I do believe that this is the most important text we could ever understand. Right here. But the irony of that is that the person that I'm preaching about is the king of the universe, and he is in utter humiliation in front of a crowd of people. So, I'm going to do my best to just sort of fall on my face this morning 
if at all possible. And I think in the end, what we're going to be best served by is just getting a firm grasp, not only on the crucifixion, yes, we want to do that, but also understand how Matthew is presenting it to us right here. Because what he's doing in this text and what he's showing us, often we can read over it, just gloss right over it, and we can get up off our couches and we can walk on and go, the crucifixion happened, amen, praise the Lord. But what Matthew is actually doing here is so beautiful if we'll stop for just a moment to understand it. And so to actually grasp what he's saying about the crucifixion is going to be pivotal for us this morning. But the second is we're going to try to understand why this is happening. Why the crucifixion? Have you ever asked that question to yourself? What does a guy 2,000 years ago dying on a cross of wood have to do with me? Why does that do anything for my sin? So as we try to get a firm grasp on how Matthew is telling the story, you need to see that he's showing us that there are two plans coming together in this crucifixion of Christ. There's there's two plans coming from completely opposite directions that are coming together and they're meeting on this hill called Golgotha. The first plan is the plan of sinful men. That is abundantly clear. The plan of sinful men culminates right here at the apex of this hill called the place of the skull, called Golgotha. So they're, they're going outside the city and where Jesus is to be crucified, outside of the city walls on a hill. Not necessarily one that looks like a skull, but at least one that is called the place of the skull. And so in verse 31, Matthew tells us that on their way out of the city, they meet this man named Simon. He is of Cyrene, which is in the modern area of Libya in the northern part of the African continent. And so there are two pieces of this to underscore, I think. One is that this is another reminder that Jesus is alone. You you realize that? All of his disciples have fled. And so who is there left to carry his cross? None other than a complete and total stranger. And the second irony that's present is that this man's name is Simon. Not a few passages ago, we saw another Simon, Simon Peter, completely deny Jesus and flee, who was one of his disciples. And now here, this Simon, who is a complete and total stranger, is literally going to carry his cross. Remember, Jesus has defined what discipleship means is to carry your cross and follow me. Literally, this Simon, who is a complete stranger is going to literally carry a cross, and the rest of the Gospels tell us he is literally going to follow Jesus up the hill where he is to be crucified. It should also be noted that we not only know this man's name, but Mark tells us we also know the names of his children, Alexander and Rufus. Now, how is it that we come to know the names of not only Simon, who is from a faraway land, but also Alexander and Rufus? It's likely that the reason these names are familiar to the Christian community is because these people are familiar to the Christian community, probably because they are members of it. Meaning that at some point in their journey of life, they came to know Christ as Savior in all likelihood. But beyond that, there are two central sinful characters coming into this passage that are going to be mocking Jesus. And the passage is actually split between the two groups. You see, the first group is the Gentiles, represented by the Roman soldiers, who are putting him on the cross and are forcing him to carry his cross. And the second group that's in this passage, that's also taking part in the mocking, is a group of Jewish people who are there saying to him all kinds of nasty and vile things. So they get to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, and they offer him, you see this, the Gentiles, the Romans, they offer him this drink mixed with gall. Gall literally means bitterness. So they've put bitterness inside the wine and they've given him a cup to drink for his crucifixion. Now there's some people that think that this cup that they give them, uh, give him a cup of wine is meant as a generous thing. 
meant as a kind of an act of kindness because a cup of wine would dull the nerves. And I know what you're probably thinking. This passage does not read like anything they're doing is an act of kindness, right? And you would be correct. Nothing here is an act of kindness. That brings the gall into the picture. They've taken the cup of wine, which is essentially a Tylenol or an ibuprofen in the first century, and they've mixed with it the bile from an animal's liver. They've literally put bile, acid, that's used to break down food and all kinds of things, into this cup. So if Jesus wants the ibuprofen, then he has to down it with acid. That's the kindness. So it's a mixed thing. Now for you and I, we might happily trade. I've never tasted gall. I don't know what exactly that's like, but we might take that trade for what we're about to endure just as a way of numbing the nerves. But Jesus chooses to face the crucifixion in full. What is the next way that they mock him? They strip him naked. If you see there in verse 35, they're dividing his garments. They have stripped him completely naked and have fastened him to a cross. Now he's been beaten so badly, it appears, that he can't carry his own cross up the hill, but they strip him of all the clothing they have, and they nail him to this cross of wood, which Matthew just seems to go right past. They, they've crucified him. They, they put him up on the cross, and they raise him on this hill. Why? So that all the passers-by can see this man who has done some awful atrocity and can mock him and ridicule him, a goal that they achieve here at the end of the passage. Not only that, but they further mock him by putting him between two robbers. Did your mom tell you when you were a kid, you lay down with dogs and you wake up with fleas? You're guilty, in other words, by association. So the hope is, putting him in between two robbers, that he will be declared guilty amongst anybody that's passing by who doesn't know the nature of the story or what's been taking place, that he is guilty by association. Yeah, he's crucified amongst a bunch of robbers, not only that, but on top of that, as he is watching, they have not only taken his clothes off of his body, but now they begin rolling dice for who gets the clothes. It's similar to robbing a grave, except in this case, the dead man is alive and is watching them do it. They put a charge over his head, which is another way of mocking. And it says in the charge, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Now, the Romans are obviously in charge of the crucifixion. They're the ones that are responsible to put him on the cross. And the crime is written above the crucified person's head. So the robbers, no doubt, also have the crime, the charge, put over their head as well. Robbing or insurrection or a number of different things, whatever the specific charge might be, that is obviously written over their head as well as it would be anybody who was crucified. And the people that are walking by can see exactly what the person is charged for and they can know not to do it. This keeps peace amongst the population as they see that this is what happens to kings who oppose Caesar. Remember the, the Pirates of the Caribbean where the, the pirates are hung outside the town and it says, Pirates, ye be warned. The symbol is, you come in here into this city, because remember they're on the outskirts of the city, you come in here to this city and you start thinking that you're going to overthrow Caesar, this is what's going to happen to you. This is the king of the Jews and this is what he got. He got exactly what was coming to him. Now, the charge has an ironic meaning to us, doesn't it? Because you've been reading this gospel since the very beginning of the book, and you see a bit of irony that's there in this title. That this is not just a charge, it's a description of who he actually is. It's a title. This is Jesus, and he is the king of the Jews. In fact, the Jews actually pick up on this irony. They know that this title is written in a very strange way, and they don't like it. In fact, John tells us in John 19, verse 19, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, 
the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Now, Pilate and the Roman Gentiles aren't concerned with the irony. They actually want it to be ironic. They want people to look at it and see that this is a title, that he is the king of the Jews, and this is what we have done to him. Don't mess with us. This is the kind of power that we have. The Jews see it as a title, and they don't like it. All of it, though, all of this is designed by the Gentiles to utterly humiliate the king of the Jews. And they have accomplished their goal. Now, seeing what the Romans have done, there is a second half of this passage where the Jews chime in. They're bringing their mocking and, and things to the table as well. They participate in this embarrassment of Jesus. It says that the people who are walking by are wagging their heads, shaking their heads in other words, and deriding him, making fun of him. They're attempting to use the words that they've heard him say or that they've understood him to say to mock him. They say that he's going to destroy the temple and that he could rebuild it, and yet he can't even save himself. It should be noted that that's not actually what he said. Remember, John 2, verse 19, Jesus says, Destroy this temple, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He's not talking about the building, he's talking about his body as he begins to make clear. And he's giving them a command, destroy, not I will destroy, destroy this temple and I will build it up. And of course, by the temple, he means his body, which ironically is exactly what they're doing. They're attempting to destroy his body. Nevertheless, they're, it says they're making fun of him based on the things that they've heard him say or heard that he was said through a game of telephone. You've played that before where the, the, the message changes by the time you get to the end. It doesn't matter that they've actually heard this. They've heard other people telling them what he said, and so they're often misquoting him uh, from his own words. They say, if you are the Son of God, they tell him, if you are the Son of God, come down off that cross, then we will believe. He says, you've saved yourself, you can't, uh, you've saved others, you can't save yourself. King of Israel, huh? Well, why don't you come down off that cross, King? And finally, do you trust in God? Does God actually like you? Well, then let God deliver you. Surely, if you, he likes you, he will step in and intervene. They're asking for yet another sign. And if mock and ridicule from the people on the ground isn't enough, the robbers who are crucified next to him begin to taunt him as well. The Jewish population, the Jewish chief priests, the Jewish robbers, they're all wagging their heads and deriding him. Jesus is a crucifixion that's hatched in the minds of sinful men. Do you get that? Do you see that? Matthew is demonstrating for you the pinnacle of everything that sinful humanity has planned they have now put into place on this hill called Golgotha. This is an unholy collaboration between Jew and Gentile, and he doesn't leave anybody out. The disciples have fled. He's going to give us some indication that there are some women looking on from a distance. But other than that, the disciples have fled. The Jews and Gentiles, lay people and chief priests, Herod, Pilate, and the Roman soldiers, they're all guilty. They've all hatched this plan, and it's all coming to a climax there on the hill called Golgotha. So that's one plan coming in, the plan of sinful men. But then there is also, in this passage, the plan of a righteous God. And if you're just reading the passage, you might totally miss it, of what Matthew is actually showing you here. But here's what I would like to see. I would like to see if perhaps we can look at the crucifixion of Christ 
from another angle. We know the angle that's presented to us here on the surface of the text, which is the Jews and Gentiles collaborating to put to death the Son of God. But if we shift our perspective, perhaps we can let Jesus speak in His own words. What if, what if just for a brief glimpse of time, you were to actually lay hold of a journal that Jesus had written in where He recounted His crucifixion. And He he wrote it like it was happening to Him at the moment. What would it sound like? It might sound something like this. O Lord, how many are my foes Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me Mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. For he delights in him. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing... They cast lots. That might be what it would sound like. Now, all those passages that I just read come from the book of Psalms, and they were written some 1,000 years before Jesus was ever crucified. And yet, they seem to give a journal account from Jesus' own perspective of his crucifixion. Now, Matthew doesn't tell you that he is quoting from the Psalms, does he? But you can hear Matthew's words that he just used, that we just read. You can hear Matthew's words in the description of the people that are gathered around the cross detailing what has happened to him, what is happening to him. In fact, if you didn't know that these were Old Testament passages that Matthew is quoting, he's just slipped them in there seamlessly. If you didn't know that they were Old Testament passages, you would think he was just coming up with these words on his own. That he was just giving you a description of the actual event of what took place there on the hill of Golgotha. However, now that you know He has seamlessly dropped in these passages from the Psalms, these Old Testament passages. And there's more coming in the next passage where he says, My God, my God, where have you forsaken me? What do you think that means that Matthew is telling you about the crucifixion of Jesus? What does it mean that Matthew is just dropping in these texts that of, of what is a prophecy that is actually coming to fulfillment that was some 1,000 years before Jesus actually went through it. What do you think he's telling you? He's telling you that the crucifixion of Jesus, down to the most minute detail, was completely and totally predestined by God. Completely and totally predestined by God. Now, by that, I don't mean that God looked into a crystal ball, He saw what was going to happen, 
and then he went back and he told the prophets so that they could write it down. That wouldn't be very impressive. Any more than a friend who has already seen the movie telling you what happens in the end. No. The reason that it's impressive is not because he knew the end and he told the prophets what would happen, but because he decreed it to happen this way and it took place. That's why it's important. That's why the prophets even exist. Do you understand that's why the prophets are helpful? It's because they tell us that God has decreed something from before the foundations of the world and then we watch it play out. In other words, God's Word is not going to be thwarted. That's why it's important. That's why predestination is pivotal for us to understand. Don't take my word for it, though. Look at how the Scriptures actually depict the crucifixion of Christ. First, in the book of Isaiah, which comes 800 years before Jesus. Isaiah 53, 3-10, we read part of it earlier. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed." All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, living stricken for, for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Listen to this. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his mind. That's 800 years before Christ ever goes to the cross. Isaiah tells us exactly how it's going to play out. That this servant of God is going to be crushed for your iniquities and for my iniquities. He's going to lay on that cross of wood where they're going to pierce his hands and his feet for your sin and for my sin. And that this was the plan of God to crush him. Now, how about from the church moving forward to after Jesus' crucifixion, his resurrection, and his ascension? Here's how the church, as they're praying, led by no doubt Peter in Acts 4, 24 to, 28, 24 to 48. They lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Those are the people that we saw, the plan of sinful men coming together, right? What does he say then? To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Every single thing that Herod and Pilate, every single thing that the chief priests, that the Gentiles and the Jews had done or planned to do, came together in this one culminating event on the hill called Golgotha. It was a plan hatched in their sinful minds, and yet every detail was written down before the foundations of the world by God Himself and decreed to take place. The message of the cross 
is one of God's total sovereignty. Do you understand that? Everything about the crucifixion, from top to bottom, every detail, predestined by Him. Now that might make you uncomfortable. It should. Because killing the Son of God is the most wicked thing anyone could ever do. There is no sin that has ever been committed in the history of mankind or ever will be committed in mankind's future that is as heinous as the killing of the Son of God. And yet there in the pages of Scripture are the wicked perpetrators, Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, they say doing whatever God's hand had and plan had predestined to take place. All the people, down to the passerby, who sinfully looks up on the cross with derision and makes fun of the Son of God who is hanging there. All of it predestined. And that might cause you to think, well, how can God predestine the murder of His Son and not be complicit in the sin itself? Right? This is the problem, isn't it, that we run into? Well, well, how does that work? How can God actually plan this and predestine everything down to the most minute detail, including, he tells us in the Psalms, the derision that these people are demonstrating to Christ as he's hanging there on the cross. How can he predestine that to take place, decree that to take place, and not be complicit in the sin itself? Well, Isaiah also tells us, there in verse 5 of chapter 53, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for whose iniquities? For our iniquities. In other words, the supplier of the evil motivations that it took to put Christ on the cross and put Him on the hill called Golgotha, all the evil that was required, all the sin that was required to place Him there, all the evil motivations came from within the heart of you and me. It did not come from the heart of God. Everything that He planned to take place was for the good of His people. He supplied no evil motivations in the crucifixion of Christ. In other words, we see that it was Jew and Gentile, chief priests, Roman soldiers, but it might as well have been you and me. Because I would have been there too. Mocking, deriding. That's what you get when you mess with Rome. That's what you get When you mess with God, when you call yourself God, that's what you get. My evil heart was there. It was my sins for which he died. But Isaiah also tells us on the back half of that verse, verse 5, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with His wounds we are healed. That is the reason God put Him on the cross. That is the reason for the sin and the derision and all the things of the people that are there on the cross. was so that He could bring to His people forgiveness of sin and peace. Pilate's intentions were not to heal. Nor would mine have been. The scoffers' intentions were not to bring peace, nor would mine have been. In every sin that I've ever committed, I supply all the evil necessary within my heart to make it sin. I bring it. It's all me.
God's predetermination, His foreordination, is 100% for my good and for His glory. Period. He cannot and will not be complicit in sin. Not the sin of these people, nor any sin in the future. The only thing that makes it sin are the ingredients that I bring to the table. Now, Matthew is demonstrating for us here in this passage, because you've you got to think, well, why, why does this matter? Why, why do we need to understand this from Matthew? Why is it necessary that we see the two plans coming together, the sovereign plan of the Lord and the sinful plan of humanity? Why is it necessary that we understand it this way? Well, first... Because it tells us that Jesus came to satisfy the wrath that God has toward you and me for our sin. There are a multitude of explanations out there for Jesus that seek to change why he came, what he came for. One you might hear, that is, that he came to teach us how to love. It's a common explanation for Jesus in our culture. He came to teach us how to love. Another is that he came to show us God's love, came to demonstrate God's love. Some have even put Jesus in the line of other notable teachers throughout history, like Gandhi or the Buddha, or perhaps other religious teachers of the past that are good examples to live by. And that's what he was doing, that he was showing us a good way to live, well, it's true that he did tell his disciples that the world will recognize them by the love that they have for one another. So in some measure, he is coming to demonstrate for them love for one another. There's no doubt about that. And it's also true, the Bible tells us, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That is certainly true. The Bible affirms those things, and I would not seek to deny any of those things. However... What is the central reason for which he came? It's just to teach us how to love. No, when you zoom in on the crucifixion of Jesus and you understand what's happening in this scene, then you'll see that there is a sin problem that God is dealing with lying right at the center. That is, center. A sin problem lying right at the center. Those other explanations simply do not cut it if there is still a massive amount of sin that is lying in the pit of my heart. How can you teach someone to love that is so desperately wicked as my heart is? Won't cut it. Jesus is not merely the victim of the brutality of sinful man. He is suffering at the hands of God himself. It was the will of God to crush him. And he's doing that because God is offering him up as a substitute for your sin. Do you understand that? God is taking his lamb and placing it on his own altar. And he is crushing him on your behalf. So what that means for you and understanding the crucifixion of Christ this way is that your sin so radically separates you from God that an eternity in hell is an adequate punishment. Grasp that. You have to understand that. An eternity in hell is an adequate punishment for your sin. Yet we make peace with our sin and we often, often think of it as little and petty. Well, it's a little white lie. That's not lust. No, that's a harmless attraction. The fact is that we've cre we were created to be perfect. And yet here we are arguing about how close with sin we can actually be before it becomes grievous. But the point of the gospel is, you're already too close. 
It doesn't matter how good you are. You were created to be perfect. And I know that every person in this room would at least admit to the fact that you're not perfect. I don't just mean that you make mistakes on tests or that you make little driving errors every once in a while. I mean that you are a sinner. That there are occasions where you dabble in lust. There are occasions where you outright lie. That there are occasions where you are prideful and boastful and arrogant. I think we would all admit that we have sins that we struggle with on a daily basis. But this is why understanding the crucifixion this way is so vitally important that what God is doing in Christ, putting Him on the cross, is taking a cup of His wrath and dumping it out on Christ. That all of the wrath that He has stored up for all of those sins, He is turning upside down on the head of Jesus right there 2,000 years ago. That's why a person crucified 2,000 years ago can actually offer for you a substitution for your sin. Not because He shows you a better way to live, but because in Him, the wrath of God that He had stored up for me is poured out on His head. That's the only reason it can make sense. I know there are plenty of people in this room they are still in a place where they're not a follower of Jesus. Perhaps don't even buy what I'm saying. But you need to hear clearly what John says in John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. Meaning there's a second cup. Filled with the wrath of God that remains to be poured out. That is what an eternity of hell is. Perhaps, maybe, I pray that the blinders have fallen off. Maybe that was it. Understanding it that way, maybe that was the thing that God uses to just remove the blinders from your eyes. And maybe it's at that point where you say, oh my goodness, I realize I'm a sinner condemned to die. What do I do now? I'm telling you, listen clearly to me. Confess your sins to him now. He knows your heart. He knows your thoughts. He knows everything about you. Confess your sins to him now. Confess your faith and your need for Christ as your substitute. From now on, live in fellowship with this church body as we teach you what it means to obey all that He has commanded us. The reason why this is also important is because God's plan for your life, this, this is demonstrated, I think, in the crucifixion. His plan for your life doesn't stop with you believing in Jesus, with you being forgiven of your sin. We call that justification, with you being declared righteous. His plan for you doesn't stop there. He is meticulous in everything that he's done. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Do you understand what Paul is guaranteeing for you here? That because he has called you, because he has notified you of salvation, because he has brought you to the point of faith, because He has declared you righteous in Christ, because He has poured out His wrath on you, because He has predestined it all to come about before the foundations of the world, because He has done that, Paul can then guarantee He won't stop. That those whom He calls, He also justifies. Those whom He justifies, He also sanctifies. Those whom He sanctifies, He also glorifies. 
In other words, He's going to bring it about. That means for us that God's intention for you is not only the forgiveness of sin, but to also take all the hardships in life, all the difficulties, all the cancer, all the good things too, and bring them to you in a way that He shapes you and conforms you into the very character and nature of Christ. That's a veritable guarantee. And how do we know that? Because when we look back 2,000 years ago, we see that He didn't spare His own Son. But if He didn't spare His own Son, and He laid out everything that would come about for Him, can I also trust that He's going to do that for me? Yeah. The beauty of that message, and I pray you understand it, because I know I know beyond the shadow of a doubt there are people in here already thinking of all the malicious things they could potentially respond to about this message. That the word predestination causes so many to just recoil. Even though it's used in the text of Scripture, that doesn't matter. Causes them to recoil. Why? It's a beautiful and glorious truth Because it applies to every single person in Christ. Do you understand that? Every single person. If you're going through the best time in your life at this very moment, it applies to you. Do you understand that God is using that in your life? He has brought that to you as a means of bringing about the character of Christ in you so that you will praise God in the good times, that you might be able to rejoice that He has given this to you. Do you understand it also speaks to the person who is in utter despair right now? It speaks to you too. It's not in vain. All of those things you're going through, that's not in vain. God is using those to shape and equip and conform you to bring also about the character of Christ. Don't react to it like it's something to be held in disdain. It's a beautiful and glorious truth. Embrace it. See what Christ is declaring to you in the Scriptures. He has done this for His own Son to bring about the resurrection and the salvation of His people. If He has brought about my salvation in this way, can't I trust everything He does to me is for my good and for his glory? You bet. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we wrestle with truths as complicated, as complex, as difficult as this one is, I pray that we would embrace it. Give us hearts that respond to it in joy. Let us see your word as it's revealed in the text. Not as we think it to be, not as philosophers tell us it should be, but as it it actually is in the text. I pray that through that we would come to be the most rejoicing people that the world has ever seen. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.